Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Uh, welcome to episode 119, I think it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you at things that I think matter and that I think are worthy of your attention. If you have any reactions to the show, you can always email me directly. It's whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, which you probably didn't, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there if you prefer. Uh, as always, if you do email me, please uh, be a little patient about getting an answer. I will answer. Um, and also, please, in the subject line, include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or CCAT or something so that I know it's not spam. All right, with that, we've got a lot of stuff to get to today, so let's get right into it. First, I got a couple of updates about things that we have talked about before here. Uh, one is that a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned some of these sneaky ways that legislators in uh, North Carolina have been trying to pass new restrictions on the right to an abortion by sneaking in provisions without debate, hearings, or even announcement into totally unrelated bills. Their most recent example is that they did this with a bill about motorcycle safety. Well, that bill, that motorcycle safety bill with these provisions, uh, has passed both houses of the North Carolina State Legislature. What that, those provisions will do is eliminate abortion coverage and insurance plans for public employees and for individuals who wound up getting health insurance under the new health care law through the public exchanges that are going to be set up, which, of course, limits access by making the procedure more expensive. Uh, it also imposes additional standards on abortion clinics, requiring them to meet the same standards as outpatient surgical centers which is medically unnecessary and which a lot of them can't afford to do. So a number of them are closed, which will limit access by having, you know, again, fewer centers to do it. Well, despite a, a, a pledge during a debate, then candidate for governor, Pat McCrory, said at that time he would not sign any legislation that further restricted access to abortion. Despite that, he declared himself pleased with this bill, said it does not limit access, and has signed it into law. Uh, another thing we've talked about is the Supreme Court's decision on the Voting Rights Act, and that is already having an impact. Within hours of the ruling, officials in Texas, Mississippi, and Alabama said they were going to begin enforcing strict photo ID requirements for voters in the state, which uh, a requirement which has a demonstrably disparate racial impact. North Carolina is moving to impose similar limits. Um, just recently, the state Senate has approved legislation that would eliminate, in addition to requiring photo IDs, would eliminate same-day registration and cut early voting by a week. Now, you know, back in the Jim Crow era, black people who wanted to vote uh, faced uh, poll taxes, literacy tests, and violence. The methods of suppressing votes today are more sophisticated. It doesn't mean they're any less effective. And, you know, I got to tell you, too, it's not just the South. It's not just the South. Uh, more than 30 states have passed laws in the last few years requiring photo ID at um, at elections. Photo ID is something that minorities and poor people disproportionately lack, so they are the ones really affected by this. And if that bludgeon wasn't enough, there is always the stiletto of redistricting, which can turn a razor-thin reactionary majority into a crushing one, which is exactly what's happened in North Carolina. The impacts of the ruling are being felt at the courthouse as well as at the state house. For example, in Florida, there was a suit filed by an Hispanic civil group and uh, two naturalized citizens to uh, block a proposed voter purge in Florida. A federal court has now dismissed that suit, saying that because of the Supreme Court decision, the purge can't be stopped. Uh, and, and the Supreme Court decision, which again gutted the Voting Rights Act, basically invited Congress to uh, redo the law, to come up with a new formula to determine what districts of the country are sufficiently bigoted to require pre-clearance of any change in their voting laws. Now, when I talked about this after the decision, I asked you if you could imagine that happening in this Congress any time in the next century. Well, if you thought that they might, you were wrong. 
Members of Congress, especially the right-wingers in Congress, have no interest in and no intention of doing anything about the Voting Rights Act. Not a damn thing. In fact, in the words of the knuckle-dragger Representative Joe Barton, ain't gonna happen, quote-unquote. I mean, and why should it? Why should there be any changes, they say? Why should there be any effort? House Judiciary Committee Chairman Bob Goodlett uh, opened a recent hearing for the committee by saying that even after the Supreme Court's decision, quoting, other very important provisions of the Voting Rights Act remain in place, which they do, which they do. One of those provisions actually allows courts to impose a preclearance requirement on districts which are found to have intentionally discriminated under the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. Private groups in Texas have filed a suit on exactly that basis, um, and to its credit, the Obama administration has filed what's called a statement of interest in support of those groups, saying that Texas should be subject to preclearance requirements for another 10 years. Attorney General Eric Holder said this is the first such move the administration has made in response to the SCOTUS ruling, uh, and he said it will not be our last. Let's hope so. Oh, by the way, there's a footnote to this. Remember Bob Goodlett saying that other very important provisions of the Voting Rights Act remain in place? <laughs> According to the House reactionaries, because the Obama administration has now used one of those other provisions, it has poisoned the well for renewal of the Voting Rights Act. So the failure to act is now, they say, Obama's fault. Sometimes you just got to laugh. All right, moving on from there to one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity. We had multiple aspirants for the Big Red Nose this week, a veritable plethora of worthy candidates. For example, we had Representative Virginia Fox, who makes me think of what the Bride of Frankenstein would have looked like if she had lived long enough to get senile. Uh, she declared that the federal government should have no role in trying to make college accessible or affordable for students which, of course, would put her against the GI Bill, Pell Grants, and a whole raft of other programs. She said this, by the way, while backing legislation that would bar the Obama administration from enforcing new rules on for-profit colleges, institutions which have been found by several investigations to uh, found guilty of deceptive marketing and of promoting fraud. Uh, then... We have Senator Ted Cruz, who claimed that if the Senate immigration bill becomes law, in 10 or 20 years, the number of undocumented workers in the United States will swell from the now estimated 11 million to, quote, 20 or 30 million, unquote. When asked to back that up, Senator Crazy's office said his statement, quoting, cannot possibly be fact-checked because it was not a factual statement. It was an opinion. What's more, they said, no one can question that opinion because, quoting, any attempt to assess the truth or falsity of this statement would simply be political editorializing. This is known as the nyan yeah can't touch me gambit, which most of us drop by, say, the fifth grade as too childish. And we also have the Gopper leadership of the House of Representatives. Um, last week, they passed a bill with a provision barring funding for the anti-poverty organization ACORN. In fact, nearly every bill coming out of the House Appropriations Committee contains language barring federal funding for ACORN. ACORN does not exist. It shut down three years ago. It uh, was brought down by years of attack by the right wing, culminating in a combination of a lying video by wannabe scumbag James O'Keefe and bogus, unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud. ACORN closed its doors in 2010, yet to this day, the GOP still continues year after year, bill after bill, to bar funding for a group that doesn't exist. Boogeyman much? All right, but the winner, and at the end of the day, she was the clear winner, Winner was Lauren Green of Fox News. On July 26th, she interviewed, if I can stretch the word that far, she interviewed uh, a religious scholar named Reza Aslan. He's the author of a new book about the life of Jesus called Zealot, the Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. The first thing out of her mouth was, you're a Muslim, so why did you uh, write a book about the founder of Christianity? Well, Aslan responded by noting he's actually a biblical scholar, uh, a scholar of religions. He has four degrees, including one in the New Testament. He's fluent in biblical Greek, and he's been studying the origins of Christianity for two decades. 
But Green comes back with, well, it still begs the question, why would you be interested in the founder of Christianity? Because, Aslan said, he's a professor of religion, including the New Testament. He said, it's what I do for a living. Doesn't matter to Green. She proceeded to read aloud from a set of Islamic phobe commentaries, uh, which dismissed uh, Aslan's academic credentials, referring to him simply as an educated Muslim with an opinion about Jesus. This went on for nearly 10 minutes, and during this entire time, Green repeatedly posed a series of innuendo-laden questions that were obviously intended to, to portray Aslan as some religiously-minded agitator who wrote a hit piece against Christianity. She referred to Aslan, you don't talk about the, the real Jesus, she said, and also charged that he was dishonest because she said in interviews he didn't go out of his way to say that he was Muslim. Which, of course, is completely irrelevant to the issue at hand, which is the book. And in fact, uh, it has to do with the content of the book, with which Green was, unsurprisingly, unfamiliar. One wonders if Green would ask the same sort of questions about a Christian who wrote a book about the founding of Islam. Actually, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't wonder that. Not about a clown like Lauren Green. All right our other regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. In a major speech on national security this spring, uh, President Barack Obama said repeatedly that the U.S. is at war with, quoting, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and their associated forces. Well, in a hearing before the Senate Armed Services Committee in May, Senator Carl Levin asked the, Just uh, the Defense Department to provide him with a list of current Al-Qaeda affiliates. Levin's office later said that the Pentagon's answer included the information requested, but said that they were not allowed to discuss the contents of the letter because, as a Pentagon representative later said, revealing such a list could cause, quote, serious damage to national security, unquote, because it would enable those groups to build credibility by being on such a list. And the words of DOD Representative Lieutenant Colonel Jim Gregory, we cannot afford to inflate these organizations. Now, Jack Goldsmith, who was a professor at law at Harvard, he said the Pentagon's reasoning seems weak. Uh, quoting, he said, if the organizations are inflated enough to be targeted with military force, and by the way, they are, dozens of drone strikes in places like Yemen and Somalia. But he said, if they're inflated enough to be targeted with military force, why can't they be mentioned publicly? Now, one reason the government might have is to avoid embarrassing itself. Uh, at that same May hearing, Michael Sheehan, who is Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict, Michael Sheehan described terrorist groups as murky and shifting which is a bureaucratese way of saying we actually don't know who they are and we just kind of take pot shots whoever happens to raise their head because we don't know what we're doing. But here's the more likely reason. They just don't want to tell us. They want us to continue to live in a vague, unfocused fear of dark forces out there. Forces that are undefined but are just waiting to get us, to get after us, to, to destroy our way of life, to murder us in our beds. Please protect us, please. We'll be good, please. The bottom line here is that, as Jack Goldsmith quite accurately called it, a remarkable testament to this unusual war. The bottom line here is that we are, according to our misleaders, at war with Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and their associated forces. But who those associated forces are, where they are, when, how, and where we are fighting them is all classified. It's a military secret which we, the people, are not entitled to know. We are not entitled to know who we are at war with. And if you don't find that an outrage, maybe you just better check your citizenship on the door, at the door on your way out. And footnote, by the way, here's another reason why they might not be happy about this. Uh, the U.S. has clandestine war in Somalia against al-Shabaab, which is one group they have named as an associated force. It was touted last year as an unqualified success, which is probably why they were willing to name the group. It may be in danger of unraveling. According to a recent analysis, al-Shabaab remains intact and has actually preserved the core of its 5,000-person fighting force as well as its resources. We're going to take a break.
And welcome back. Welcome back. Here's something I bet you didn't know. Come November, the 22 million American households, which include 47 million Americans, these are the people who rely on food stamps, they're going to see their benefits cut. The average household's monthly benefit will drop from $20 to $25 a month. The general public doesn't realize this, the low-income people on the program don't realize this, and Congress has no interest in or intention of doing a damn thing about it. Is this happening? Because back in 2009, there was a 13% boost in food stamp benefits as part of the stimulus bill. That boost is expiring come November. The original idea was to let inflation gradually catch up with this boost so that by the time the stimulus ended, that food stamp recipients wouldn't actually see a reduction in the dollar amount they got for benefits. It was a nice idea, which of course got screwed up. The Obama gang needed money to offset the cost of some other spending programs. They kept taking it from the food stamp budget. And so by the time they came to replace the money, they never got around to doing it. And now there's no chance of that money being replaced, considering that the debate in Congress over food stamps is not whether to cut the program, but how much to cut the program. By the way, the food stamp program now is formally called SNAP which stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, but a lot of people still call it food stamps. So. Uh, so the other part of this debate is not only over how much to cut the program, but what other sort of onerous or degrading requirements can be placed on people in order to participate. Uh, one thing, for example, um, work programs. Work programs, these are being proposed under the ever popular classist notion and by the way, classism is like contempt for the poor. Uh, it's, it's, these are being proposed under the popular classist notion that poor people are just lazy. And what they, only, what they really need is to be instructed in the dignity of work. Representative Steve Sutherland calls this moral reformation. This despite the fact that 92% of recipients of food stamps, food stamp benefits, are children, the elderly, disabled, or people who are already working. Other ideas uh, uh, floating around, including reducing the automatic food stamp eligibility for people who get certain other, uh, other benefits. One, some people say you want to turn the whole program into a block grant, which basically means just taking a hunk of money, giving it to states, and saying, eh, do what you want. If you want to use it for food stamps, eh, it's okay too. Uh, and another repeat offender idea, drug testing recipients under the ever popular classist notion that poor people are really just lazy and drug addicts. Now, if there's no agreement on a food stamp program, Congress uh, will just have to continue, have a continuing resolution to continue current funding of food stamps and the farm bill of which it has been part. But be that as it may, that cut in November is still coming. Now, a cut of $25 a month may not seem like a lot, but think of it this way. The current maximum benefit for a family of four is $668 a month. Uh, so figure a 30-day month, three meals a day, four people in the house, that's 360 meals uh, a month. So the benefit is a princely $1.86 per person per meal. And then you have the ignorant, sneering buffoons who, in the face of that, wonder why people on food stamps are buying cheap, processed, but filling foods rather than expensive fresh fruits and fresh vegetables and whole grains and so on. But this also means that a cut of $25 a month in benefits is 13 or 14 meals a month that somebody has to skip. And this adds up over time. According to the calculations for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, there are about 870,000 people in Massachusetts who will be impacted by these cuts, Cuts will, which will, over the period of November 2013 to October 2014, be cuts of totaling $61 million. And we're doing this, doing all this, at a time when uh, three-quarters of Americans, according to a recent study, three-quarters of American families are living paycheck to paycheck. 76% of Americans have less than six months worth of savings to their name. Half have less than three months. More than a quarter don't have any savings at all. 
And we're doing this at a time when a new survey by the Associated Press reveals that four out of five U.S. adults struggle with joblessness, near poverty, or reliance on welfare for at least part of their lives. It's called economic insecurity, and it's defined as a year or more of periodic joblessness, reliance on government aid, such as food stamps, or having an income below 150% of the poverty line. By the time they reach 60, 79% of American adults will have experienced economic insecurity at some point in their lives. And even among whites, whose rates of poverty and unemployment are always dramatically below those of non-whites, the experience of economic security will have touched 76% of them by the time they hit 60. In fact, hardship among whites is growing faster than among non-whites, which may well be because those minorities already don't have as much to lose since their poverty rates are already far higher than among whites, but it doesn't change the impact on the people who are affected. The overall poverty rate in the country remains stubbornly stuck at 15%. But equally significantly, Census Bureau figures say that about 40% of adults will have lived in poverty for at least one year of their lives. An analysis to be published next year by the Oxford University Press shows that by a majority, by, by rather by a number of different measures, racial disparities in areas like poverty, unemployment, and homelessness are shrinking, but not because blacks and Hispanics are doing better, but because white people are doing worse. We are increasingly all in the same boat, and it's leaking. AP calls this a sign of deteriorating economic security and an elusive American dream. I call it the next phase of the class warfare being, raged by the, being waged by the rich against the rest. Meanwhile, rich investors say it takes at least $5 million for them to feel wealthy, and two-thirds of millionaires say they're not rich. And at the same time, we're, Congress is saying that what, what the rest of us need is moral reform. And McDonald's grandly insists that, of course, their employees can make it an 825 an hour. They just need to get a second job, never get sick, and not need food or clothing. This is the economy we are living in today. And it's not going to change unless and until we get mad enough to do something about it. And I don't mean taking a job retraining course or, or enrolling it to free college. I mean changing the very nature of our economy to emphasize cooperation over competition and social value over personal greed. And Frank, I'll have more on that as time goes on. But I got to stop there because there's something else that I have to, have to, have to talk about in the time that I have left. Bradley Manning. Remember him? I wouldn't be surprised if you went, oh yeah, him, the leaker guy. Whatever happened with that? Despite the importance and the significance of the actions in the case, which included charging a military whistleblower with aiding the enemy for the first time since the Civil War, the media in this country pretty much let the whole business slide with just the, uh, just the occasional reference Admittedly, that lack of coverage was uh, sort, of in, sort of emphasized by the military court, uh, which uh, put, put great burdens on the ability of reporters to support the trial. In fact, recently, they've taken to searching the reporters and their cars and having armed guards stand behind them while they're working on their laptops at the press area. This was done, the judge said, because of earlier repeated breaking of court rules, even though no one could tell the reporters what rules had been broken. But after months in solitary confinement, under conditions which, if it was done to an American by another country, we would call torture, Bradley Manning was brought to trial. And today, July 30th, Colonel Denise Lynn, the judge in that military trial, and by the way, in the course of this, I'm reminded of an article I read years ago. The title was, Military Justice is to Justice as Military Music is to Music. But Colonel Lynn handed down her verdict. She convicted Bradley Manning of many of the major charges, but be thankful for what you get, acquitted him of aiding the enemy. That was a charge everyone was focused on for two reasons uh, beyond its rarity. One, it was the most severe, carrying a potential uh, a penalty of life without parole. And two, the impact of the conviction on future ability of the public to learn what it should know, uh, which the government, which, for whatever reason, didn't want to tell us. It would have been severe. 
So you got to remember, Bradley Manning was not accused of giving information to Al-Qaeda. He was not accused of wanting Al-Qaeda to have that information. He was not accused of wanting to help Al-Qaeda. He was accused of giving information to a media organization, knowing that Al-Qaeda could see that information, whatever of that, that that media organization chose to publish. Even if that information itself was of no use to Al-Qaeda, it could perhaps be analyzed and combined with other information uh, and thereby reveal something of use to Al-Qaeda. That, believe it or not, is the actual argument, that is the actual case the prosecution made in order to charge Bradley Manning with aiding the enemy. A conviction would have set a precedent that any leak of information the government doesn't want us to know, um, any leak of information the government found embarrassing, any leak of information which could be hypothetically linked to some other information that in any way could be useful to our enemies, even if, again, the names of those enemies are classified, could be aiding the enemy. We as a people dodged a bullet, but it's not over. We did get hit by shrapnel. Manning was convicted of computer fraud and some other lesser military infractions, as well as, bizarrely, five counts of stealing government documents, even though the documents never left the government's possession. More importantly and more seriously, something else that did not trouble Colonel Lind was convicting Bradley Manning of six counts of espionage for providing information to WikiLeaks. Six counts of espionage for leaking information to the press. And in all six of those cases, Manning had pled guilty to a lesser charge, but Lind and the prosecutors refused to accept that, and he was convicted on the full original charge. So despite the acquittal on aiding the enemy, Bradley Manning still faces 136 years in prison for daring to tell people what they deserve to and need to know. And remember this, the government has ranted and raved about damage to national security. But in the three years since he, Bradley Manning was arrested, they have not offered a shred of evidence, not a single scrap, not a single thread of argument as to how what he did actually did hurt national security. This is the hard truth. This is the hard truth. This case was not about protecting the nation. It was not about, it was about protecting the privileges of the powerful. This is about control. This is about imperious condescension of a government and military elite treating the rest of us as, as the joke has it, mushrooms. It wasn't about the Obama gang getting another skin to hang on its wall of secrecy. Don't you forget this. Bradley Manning is a hero. I'm gonna close with our weekly reminder. As of July 30th, at least 6,672 Americans have been killed by gunfire in this country since Newtown, at least 68 of them in Massachusetts. We'll see you next week.